<laughs> well, here. Thank you very much. We are going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 17 starting tonight, and you do have uh, notes there, or so not notes, but some maps that you should be familiar with. Uh, of course, here's the Dead Sea, Jordan River, here's the Mediterranean Sea over here. The Valley of Elah is, is important in our story tonight. We kind of left off with this. There's the, the, the city of Azekah sits up on top here, and from Azekah, yeah, we, you can see different places. There's a, a wadi that runs through here into this valley that drains off the, the hill country of Judea. And Saul was, Saul's camp was over in here. The Philistines were over in here. And you can kind of see details of it. Because the Philistines had marched up the valley of Elah. And Saul had marched from up here in, in the land of Benjamin where Gibe is. He'd marched down into here and was meeting the Philistines here. It's actually called the Field of Blood because it was kind of on the border. There's a lot of conflict right here. It's kind of like... The West Bank was meeting the land of Israel, except the West Bank was further in right here. Not, not the West Bank, the Gaza Strip had moved in further. Bethlehem would be right about in here. And a couple of David's older brothers, of course, are already over here with Saul getting ready for battle. We mentioned last week about the duels, the type of warfare that was common at this time in, in Grecian warfare. You, you, know, if you ever watch Greek shows, Greek movies, talk about Greek warfare, a lot of times there'd be the two heroes that would fight each other. It's even in the legends that Homer writes about it. And at this time, uh, the Philistines that had come in here were probably the sea people that had come down from the north or had come in from here, the Greeks, a different uh, uh, race of people than the Philistines of Abraham's. They had a heavy Greek culture. And they were this type of dueling was going to be prevalent throughout this the time of 1 Samuel and David. And so right here, it fits perfectly, say, you know, 1000, 1005 B.C., uh, about that time period. Of, of history here, you know, 1010 or something. Okay, so we are in 1 Samuel chapter 17. I was in 2 Samuel there. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to start reading through this, and a lot of things begin to happen. Uh, Saul is, again, the story is about the recovery time from the days of Judges that they've recovered because of Samuel, kind of teaching the people about the things of God. Saul was chosen, going to be the kind of the, the lightning rod of the direction for these people who's going to help lead the people. But he was, the, he was very important for Saul to follow God. He was kind of like, again, the lightning rod. He was going to be the one that made contact with God. But once Saul stops following God and starts taking things in his own hands, Samuel is going to rebuke him and tell him, God's rejected you. He's no longer going to lead you. He's not going, going to uh, direct you. But you're still the king. Good luck. And so Saul's now really struggling. He's lost the spirit of God as far as the leadership. Again, we can't, I don't think we want to make a connection between our salvation and the spirit abiding in us and Saul being anointed to be the king. He would lost the spirit as far as he didn't lose the kingship. He lost the spiritual leading. I don't think I, I, you're making a real stretch. You can do it if you want to, of making a comparison between our salvation being in the body of Christ and Saul being anointed to be king by the Spirit. It's the same Spirit, but two different works of the min or ministries of the Holy Spirit. So now, here we have it right here. Um, uh, I'm going to begin chapter 17, but I'm going to pray first. Father, we come to you tonight in the name of Jesus. We do thank you again for the opportunity to look into your word. We thank you for giving us these things uh, historical to reveal yourself as how you dealt with people in the past and how you dealt through history and how we are part of the continuum of what's going on. We do ask that we'd understand the past, that we may find leader, uh, guidance for our own lives and leadership into the future as we continue to follow you. Again, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit that abides with us. And ask again that you would illuminate us to understand these things and make application to our own life and our own times. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Chapter 17, verse 1. Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Sokah in Judah. They pitched camp at Ephes Domin between Sokah and Azekah. There's Azekah. Sokah would be over on this side. And this Ephes Domin is right here in the area of the Valley of Elah. Well, Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the Valley of Elah and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. Uh, the Philistines occupied one hill, the Israelites another, with the valley in between them. And you can see this location. It looks... It, it can see exactly where, where this all took place. In fact, if you were in Azekah you, and were watching this, you could watch this whole episode take place just looking down there into the valley. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, uh, Gath from, from Azekah, if you look this way, you can see Gath over here into the west, uh, uh, from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. He was over nine feet tall, nine foot six or so. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 500 or 5,000 shekels, about 125 pounds. On his legs, he wore bronze greaves and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. 
His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod, meaning very long, and its iron point weighed 600 shekels, or the point, the arrowhead on his spear was 15 pounds on a long shaft. So again, imagine that it takes a lot of strength to hold that out there on that leverage of that shaft, but of course that was something he could deal with. But also understand, if he would throw it, it'd be a one-shot deal. It'd be his distant warfare, you know, it'd be as, he, for his, as he's approaching someone. He could throw that spear, that'd be his, his distance approach. Uh, but imagine if you got hit with that thing. I mean, a 15-pound arrowhead, you know, hitting someone. It, it, of course, very intimidating. Uh, uh, iron point weighing 600 shekels. His shield bear went ahead of him. So again, here's the, just like Saul's got armor bears, he's got a shield bear. And because he's got a maneuver, he's been trained in all of this equipment, you know, he's got all these different things he can do. There's a guy carrying a shield for him, kind of bringing up his defensive line, and he's going down and he's going to have a duel. And this is, again, common in the Greek culture. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, why do, you, why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? Are you not servants of Saul and others? Why are you challenging the Philistines? I'm a Philistine. We're your rulers. We have dominated you. And uh, you're servants of Saul. Uh, you're going to have to do something. And Saul, again, if we're going to have a uh, battle, a duel, it's going to be the champion of the Philistines, Goliath, versus the champion of Israel, which would be most likely Saul, which you can understand in Saul's condition, he's very afraid. Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, he will become, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you'll become our subjects and serve us. We don't want to slaughter the people we're going to conquer. We want to capture you and use you as slaves. But we'll make the same deal. We'll be your slaves. You won't have to slaughter us. We'll just You kill me, you can take all of our people captive. If we slaughter your champion, we'll take you captive. And we don't want to kill all the best men that are going to be our future slaves. I mean, it's a good way of saving bloodshed and keeping, you know, you know, there's, there's value in living men, not much value in dead men laying in the Valley of Elah. Then the Philistine says, this day, I mean, now he's going to take a dig at him, I defy the ranks of Israel, give me a man and let us fight each other. I defy you, come out here, is any one of you good enough? Well, on hearing the Philistine's words, Saul and the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Again, uh, dismayed, I got this written down right here. Uh, let me look real quickly. Let me do this set right here. Where did I write it down? Oh, there it is. Uh, it means breakdown by violence or confusion. There it is. And uh, the other word, terrified, simply means just fear, afraid, and, and, and just an overcoming uh, 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 petrification of being afraid of the situation. They're, they're paralyzed, basically. They're not ready. No one wants to come out and duel this guy. Now, David was the son of an Ephrathite named Jesse. Here's another introduction to David. We already have this. This is why we talk about maybe different uh, documents being put together. Here's another introduction to David. He was a son of an Ephrathite named Jesse who was from Bethlehem in Judah. Jesse had eight sons and in Saul's time he was old and well advanced in years. So Jesse, who would be the son of Obed, who was the son of Boaz and Ruth, Jesse now is himself an old man and he's got these eight sons. Uh, he was old, well advanced years. Jesse's three oldest sons had followed Saul into war. The firstborn, Eliab, the second, Abinadab, and the third, Shammah. So David's three older brothers are out here with Saul in battle. He's listening to this Goliath make these threats. Um, but David went back and forth from Saul to tend his father's sheep at Bethlehem. Remember, he'd gone to play, as we ended chapter 16, he'd gone to play the harp. He ended up being one of Saul's armor bearers, which there are many of them. He's going back and forth. He's going to the sheep. So it's not like he moved in and had necessarily a room and just, you know, was on full-time service. But he'd go play the harp when it was necessary. And, he, of course, he still had his duties back home. His father's old. His sons are, you know, his brothers are at war or in the military. Remember, uh, Samuel says the, the king at that point is going to choose your best sons and bring them into his military. So David's got a lot of responsibility. He's a, he's a harp player and he's an armor bearer, but he's also got to take care of the sheep. So he's very well uh, rounded but very responsible. Well, now this is an amazing verse right here, verse 16. For 40 days, I mean, that's, that's well over a month, the Philistines came forward every morning and evening and took their stand. So that means for 40 days, they'd line their troops up. Goliath would come up and he'd make his presentation. So it doesn't look like the Philistines militarily are too, too worried about being aggressive and taking territory. They're almost content to have like this, this, this stalemate going. Again, it's called uh, the Valley of Elah, also known as the Valley of Blood, this border right here between Israel and the Philistines. 
And it's kind of like we're just holding our ground. It's like we come up, it's like we defy you, send us a man. And if they don't, they go back to their camps and, you know, play, you know, cards or roll dice or tell war stories. And that's it. That's their daily routine. They march out, take formation, they defy Israel. Good. They're not going to, they're, they're, they're getting almost like a checkpoint. No one's going to come through here. All right, we go back to our camp. And it looks like the Philistines are, are content with that. We're just holding ground. They're not like trying to advance. They're just kind of holding ground. And Israel, in the same way, Saul especially, who's, who's, who himself is losing power, losing control, losing his own mind in a sense, he's like, all right, that's fine, we'll just hold ground here. Okay, now enters David. <clears throat> and so often, again, you want to make an application here, so often that's the way we are. As long as, the, that's the way the whole book of Judges was. Fine, just let us have our daily lives, don't interfere. You can control us, you can put pressure on us, just don't mess up our daily routine. And sometimes God wants the daily routine messed up. Sometimes God wants you to advance. And it's like, no, 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 I'm fine. I'm, I'm fine right here. And God's got to mix things up a little bit uh, to have you go to the next step. Or in this case, have Israel take the next step in their history. But they're fine, in the book of Judges, they're fine being occupied by the Philistines. Now they're fine right here after 40 days of just, just in a stalemate. This is fine. We still got food. Everybody's happy. No one's dying. Okay, verse 17. Now Jesse said to his son David, take this ephah, which is about three-fifths of a bushel, of roasted grain. So he's got some roasted grain, some, he's got some supplies he's going to send up. And again, the king would bring men into the military, but it wasn't necessarily like our military where, you know, we've got a couple sons that are in, in the military, in the Air Force. We've got another one going into the Air Force and one that was in the Marines. And, you know, they go off and it's like, wow, great, they, they're in the Marines. It's like, send us a letter sometime. And it's like, we don't need to, you know, we maybe send them a gift or send them a postcard or something. But we don't need to worry about sending them shoes. You know, we don't need to worry about sending them weapons. We don't need to worry about, are you getting your swords sharpened? You know, is it, you know, what are you doing? We just, don't even worry about them getting fed, you know. Uh, and there's a lot of things I could say right there, but I'm going to retreat back to the story here. Uh, but in this case right here, they would be taken in the military, but the family would have to supply some kind of support, militarily, food. And that's right here. Jesse's got to supply his sons with food. Take this ephah of roasted grain and these ten loaves of bread for your brothers and hurry to their camp. I mean, it's time for them to get a shipment. It's, they're, wait, they're probably waiting for food. Take along these ten cheeses to the commander of their unit. The unit would be about a thousand men. So David, Jesse's three oldest sons are in a, in a group of a thousand men, and there's a commander. And take these cheeses, kind of, you know, kind of grease the wheels for your brothers a little bit. Say, hey, this is from Jesse. These are his three sons right here. Maybe get them a better, a prominent position. And again, that's, not, that's right out of the book of Proverbs. It says a gift makes way for the one who gives it. You know, makes way. It's, nothing, it's not a bribe. It's just a gift. And it opens doors. And Jesse, who's being a man of standing himself, he knows how to open doors. Take some cheese to the commander. And maybe it's part of the taxation code, I don't know. Take along these ten cheeses to the commander. And a third thing right here, see how your brothers are and bring back some assurance from them. In other words, see how the war's going and bring me back some assurance. Make sure you see them and I want, I want a note. I want some kind of confirmation. I want a gift from them, something Abinadab sent you this, Dad. Eliab sent you this, Dad. And when I talked to, you know, Shema, he sent you this. And he, they all said, okay, good, good, they're all okay. Don't just drop it off. I want, I want some assurance everything's going fine. Uh, verse 19, there was Saul and all the men of Israel in the valley of Elah fighting against the Philistines, 15 miles away. So he's going to take off with the bread, the grain, the cheeses, and with the instructions of get some assurance that my, my sons are still alive, everything's going well. Again, David has been playing the heart for Saul, obviously, because Saul's over here. He's not an armor bearer at this time because he's not there with Saul. He's been watching the sheep. Verse 20, early in the morning, David left the flock with the shepherd, loaded up and set out as Jesse had directed. So again, it's probably supposed to be a, you know, maybe a, a one-day journey. Early in the morning, get over there, get some assurance, and get back. He leaves the sheep with a hired shepherd, probably hired somebody for the day to watch the sheep. And, and because it was his responsibility. He had to find somebody to take his place. Uh, he reached the camp as the army was going out to its battle position, shouting the war cry. Now again, so that's kind of how early in the morning, I mean, they didn't wait until lunchtime to go to war. They would, they would march. So he's leaving early in the morning, traveled 15 miles 
took Tony and I two hours to run 13 miles last weekend. So, I mean, if David's running as fast as we are, which he probably could run a little faster, um, but he wasn't running on a paved road. He's running up and down through hills, but nonetheless, you know, he, if he left at 4 o'clock in the morning and he's running uh, two or three hours, but he's carrying stuff. So, I mean, it's, you know, you got to kind of anticipate something like that. But he arrives fairly early because it says right here, uh, he reached the camp as the army was going out to its battle position, shouting the war cry. Now, what was their war, war cry? You know, something about, you know, we follow Saul, we follow God, we kill Philistines, and, you know, whatever. Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines, facing each other. Again, remember, this is the 40th time, at least, that they've done this, and no one's killing anybody. They're just shouting things at each other. David left his things with the keeper of supplies. Now, some people want to get quite, in other words, he didn't give them to the brothers. He was, maybe should have waited. He maybe should have waited until the brothers come back so he could give them the supplies. But there's apparently a checkpoint, and you can give these supplies for, maybe puts name tags on them, whatever. They're with the keeper of the supplies. Uh, they've left the things with the keeper of supplies, ran to the battle line, and greeted his brothers. So they're in battle formation. So he's ducking in through the, the men and says, hey guys, what's going on? And so now he's down there, not just looking from a Zika down in the hill or standing back watching, but he's right there with his men. We're fighting a war here, David. You shouldn't be here. But he's right there. Oh, what's going on, guys? As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from his, from his lines and shouted his usual defiance, and David heard it. So they're in formation. They made their shout, you know, their war cry, we're going to kill the Philistines today, whatever. And about that time, David comes in and checks with his brothers. David, you shouldn't be here. And they're talking to them. Everything's fine. Everything's like, we're in a little war. Then here comes, instead of the Philistines' war cry, Goliath steps up. And for the 40th time, calls for someone to come fight him. As he was talking with them, Goliath the Philistine, champion from Gath, stepped out from his line and shouted his usual defiance, and David heard it. That's the turning point. And David heard it. Saul heard it for 40 times. The brothers had heard it for over these 40 days. All of Israel had heard it for 40 days. But this time, a man of action hears it. It's not going to go well. I mean, the people are going to go, oh, yay, David. David heard it. When the Israelites saw the man, they all ran from him in great fear. He didn't shoot an arrow. He didn't throw that 15-pound, you know, bronze arrow at. He just shouted at him. It's like, oh. Now, the Israelites had been saying, do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. This is what, when David was talking to his brothers, this is apparently what they were saying in the battle lines. This is this man. He keeps coming out here. He's going to come out again. The same man comes out and shouts at us every morning. He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. Now Saul is back in his tent. He's not out there with his troops. He's back in his tent saying, I'll give wealth. I'll, t I'll exempt your family from taxes. You can marry my daughter. Whatever you want. Someone will eliminate this problem. Now watch David. It's kind of interesting. Now this Israelite had been saying, do you see how this... Okay, now the Israelites had been saying, do you see how this man, Goliath, keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his father's family from taxes in Israel. So there's three things. You're going to get wealth, which is probably some tax money. You're going to be exempt from taxes, and you're going to get the daughter. Now, the daughter means you get to marry into the royal family. I mean, the daughter herself is probably a prized possession, but it, it, it's her name. She, you get to marry into the family. Verse 26, David asked the men standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Now, what did you say will happen? The man who removed this disgrace from Israel, what is the king willing to do? Tell me this again. Uh, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? So notice, you hear what the men are saying. The men are saying this is what the king is offering. David says, tell me that again. And who is this uncircumcised, notice, uncircumcised Philistine and defying the armies of the living God? Two things just point out right here. I mean, we could preach this forever. But right here, David knows who he is, who Israel is. We are the armies of the living God. We are God's army. We are God's people. We, we are the people from Mount Sinai. We are the people that came across with Joshua. We are the people of the covenant. We are the armies of the living God. 
and the thing he knows who the enemy is. What he says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? He is exactly the opposite of what we are. We are the armies of the living God, and this man is outside the covenant. This man is on the outside with no protection. We have all the protections, all the promises, all the blessings, all of God is with us, and this man is on the outside shouting at us. <laughs> and what, what's the king going to give the person that answers to this? What is the king going to give the man who knows this doctrine, this the basic theology? They repeated to him what they had been saying and told him, this is what will be done for the man who kills him. My gosh, who's going to do it? And they're, and they're, they're all, it's like, you can just see, like, does anybody see this opportunity? Now, sometimes in the Christian life, you can see this very thing. People get so, I don't know, wrapped up in culture. They get so confused in their understanding of the Word of God. And when the Word of God is presented, do you understand what this is? It's like, oh, no, we don't. And there's, there's a fear. There's a quaking. And then someone steps and says, do you see what this means? Well, watch his brothers. When Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, like getting information and almost, you know, partway <coughs> preaching, partway encouraging them, kind of being confident, saying, Who's going to go do this? And what's going to end? Eliab like, David, you're embarrassing the family. Watch. When Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he's no longer talking to the three brothers. He's moved on to, so maybe moved up ranks. He burned with anger at him. And that, that's the same response Saul is going to have. That burning with anger, there's going to be something, a flaming up. It's like, no, don't do this began to burn with anger at him and asked, Why have you come down here? Weren't you supposed to bring us some supplies? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the desert? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. Now right there, that, that, there's so much can be said about that. You've got a man of faith who understands that they are the armies of God, this man is an uncircumcised Philistine, and you've got someone else there who, in a sense, is their superior, their, their older brother, the one that's supposed to be going out and, and taking action. And David's like, I don't see any action being done here. Eliab has to now, one, assume what David's motive is. He's assuming David's motive. He can't understand David's motive is going to be, in a sense, theological or understanding the, understanding the basic truth that they are the armies of God facing this uncircumcised Philistine. Your, your motivation must be something different because I don't have that understanding, so I can't, I can't blame that you with that understanding. So he says, uh, you've come down here to watch the battle. You're down here for entertainment pleasure. Uh, you, you came down here, and it says right here, and whom did you leave those few sheep in the desert? Aren't you supposed to be doing something else? Those, and he calls them few sheep. <laughs> That's funny. Isn't that not funny, Tony? Tony, that guy can't go on. Those few sheep takes a dig. It's like you're supposed to be watching a few sheep over here, and you're not even doing your job. You're up here looking for entertainment. This is a man's job right here, and we're busy running. <laughs> Verse 29. Now what have I done? Said now David right there. He's like, what, 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 now, what happened? What just happened? I, I'm just repeating theology. I'm hearing about this reward. There's an uncircumcised Philistine that everybody wants to eliminate. And I'm just thinking, the potential is great here. It's like, and now you're mad at me for what, for what did I just do? I, what, I don't understand what just happened here. Can't I even speak? Then he turned away to someone else and brought up the same matter. Because they kind of, they, he tried to turn away from these men who were giving the information, had to deal with Eliab's brother, okay. And it's like, ah, now, someone, tell me again, where, where, where do you sign up for this at? And brought up the same matter again, just ignored his brother. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul, and Saul sent for him. All of a sudden, you've got a man in camp, or a young man in camp, who, is he arrogant? It could be conceived as arrogance, but it's, it's mainly just an understanding. It's like, what's wrong with him? His answer, his question is, what's wrong with everybody else? Why are we all standing here? And particularly, why is Saul hiding in the camp? Or in his tent? Okay. Anyway, so Saul sends for him. So they come down, they bring David up. He says, now tell me. And now again, you know, let's just keep reading. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. 
he, and so you could tell Saul, Saul's everybody's kind of afraid, and there's very loud of concern. It's the war war room now. You know, he's in the war room, and there's some guards there. There's the the, so the commanders are there. There's Saul. It's like what are we, they probably got maps and charts. It's like you know how many days it's been, and our our strategies have been crossed off. Strategy two crossed off. It's like you can tell there's there's concern there. It's like whoa 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 hey, you guys look like you don't know what to do. Don't, don't be concerned. Hey, your servant, I will be your servant. I will deal with this. I've got a plan. So I replied, you're not able to go out against the Philistine and fight him. You're only a boy, and he's been fighting. He's been a fighting man since his youth. He says, you don't fit plan A, B, C, D. There's no plan on the wall here that we've got that will work. He says, and you don't have any experience. And this guy's a train. Look at his record over here. We've got his win record. Undefeated for 25, 30 years. This man is, these are all the men he's killed. David, you, you can't go against this. is the world champion. Saul replied, you are not able to go against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a boy, and he's been a fighting man since his youth. But David said to Saul, again, just listen, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. I've been doing my job with those few sheep my brother just made fun of. I've been doing my job. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock. Now this is, this is pretty cool. Watch this. When a lion or a bear came and carried off, they actually got a hold of the sheep. And they're, they're, they're going away with the sheep. They got the sheep in their mouth. They're running off with the animal. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it. I went after the sheep. Now, there's a whole line of thinking here. You can start talking about the shepherd's responsibility. And again, you can go back into the ancient documents from, from the, the Mari documents and the things from this time period. And there is definitions of what is required of a shepherd. And it, it includes many things. But one of the things is, is if, if the sheep is taken and you don't have any remains, you'll have to pay for it. If you can somehow bring back, you say this was captured by a wild animal, the penalty is less because the wild animal ate it, not you. You know, I mean, you know, you'd be just be eating the sheep out there in the field. I mean, there's a whole standard. But now David's going to go after, not just bring back the remains of it because it's his responsibility. He's going to go back to bring it back alive, apparently. So he says right here, they say, you can't kill this, 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 this man, this, this nine foot six guy. He says, but David says, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. Here's my experience. Here's my war record. When a lion or a bear came and carried off the sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. Meaning it's over there running off. I would strike it so it would like turn around, drop the animal, and turn to me. So I, I had it attack me so the animal went back, back, could run back to its mom or whatever. Okay? He said, I went after it. I struck it, rescued the sheep. The, the animal dropped the sheep from its mouth, and when it turned on me, so now the lions or the bears are not going to turn on, uh, drop the sheep, it's going, ah, hey, David, I love, I love human flesh better. When it turned on me, I seized it. Now imagine seizing a bear or a lion. I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. It, it, it came after me. I just stared it down. When it got close, I grabbed it, and I just struck the thing and killed it. Any questions? It's like, what? I mean, you didn't, when would you start running? I wouldn't run. I'd take the sheep and walk back. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, this is completely foreign to you know anything I've experienced. I got chased by a dog one time when I was running, and I just ran. <laughs> but it's nothing like, you know, you don't want to strike someone's dog and kill someone's dog in West Des Moines. But your servant has struck both lion and the bear. This circumcised Philistine will be like one of them. In other words, the lion, the bear, and this reminds me of the exact same situation. And this Philistine landed the same way. And, but watch this. Here's something. Now, again, David was responsible for the sheep, so he was within the realm of his responsibility to go after this lion and bear to do his job to take care of the sheep. In the same scenario, David now is, is a, a man of Israel. He's, Israel's being defied uh, by the, the uncircumcised Philistine. Just like he was responsible to go after the sheep, someone's got to take and, and, and stop this, this Goliath. And so he says right here, uh, the Lord, verse 37, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. It's the same principle. I couldn't let him walk off with the sheep. I would be wrong. I had to go do the right thing, and by doing the right thing, God was with me. If it was after the bear, if it was after the lion, I did the right thing. And now this Philistine, the right thing to do is defend Israel. 
And just like God delivered me when I did the right thing with the lion and the bear, he'll deliver me when I do the right thing against this Philistine. And the right thing is to shut his mouth. Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. It's like, wow. If nothing else, that's a good sermon. Go do it. Let's watch this. Get the video camera going. Let's see what happens. Okay. So David's going to go out and do this. But now watch. You can see Saul. Saul is convinced. He, he hears the voice of faith. He hears the voice of experience. It's like, this is better than plan A, B, C, D, all the way across. This is going to work. But now watch. He doesn't, hasn't got the same vision that David's got. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put on a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on him. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. So he says, okay, we're going to have to fight the same way. He's got his armor bearer. He's got the javelin. He's got the sword. He's got the spear. He's got the bronze armor. And he's been shouting, you're going to go out there. Here's, what, here's the things I want you to shout. You're going to, go, you're going to shout these things. You're going to walk out here in, in my armor and try to keep the helmet down so people think it's me. And, you know, go out in my armor, and then you're going to shout some things, and then you're going to go to, I guess, hand-to-hand -hand combat. And if you kill the lion and bear just chasing them down, just imagine what you do with the sword and the spear. So David says, well, okay, uh, I couldn't really chase down a lion or a bear in all this armor. He says, I'm not used to this. And so he finally, he says, I cannot, I cannot go in these. He said, so now again, you want to make the connection. He's going to go in, the, he's talking about doing the right thing, going in the name of the Lord. And, uh, and now he's, now I'm not going to go in the power of man. You can do this. But basically, I mean, you can build that case right there. You know, he's going to go in confidence and not in the confidence of man, Saul's armor, but in the confidence of the Lord's name. But you understand how, I mean, this is a great story. I, I mean, this is a great story. I'm not going to take anything away from this. But do understand, David is trained with a sling. I mean, he, and, and when you take a sling and you start swirling that thing around a, a pebble, however, and they, they, they found these sling stones. They've got, they've got, you can see them in museums, they found piles of them at different places, battle scenes. And you put that in a, in, a, in a string and swirl it around. You talk about someone throwing a baseball 9,500 miles an hour, okay, or, or even a girl softball or, or an underhand pitcher going up to 120 miles an hour because of the sling. You guys understand this, right? I mean, throwing a baseball is hard. You need to throw up to 100 miles an hour, 101 or whatever. But you start dropping your arm down and doing this sling action, uh, you're going you're gonna to build up speed because you've got the sling happening. Well, you take that same ball or stone, put it on the end of a string in a pouch, and start swinging around your head like this and let go and you know what you're doing with it. It's like shooting a pistol. I mean, it is like, it's like getting hit Goliath is going to basically, with it's, there's a scene, yeah, I'm not taking anything away from this, there's a scene, because look, Israel's been standing there for 40 days doing nothing. What made the difference was David had confidence in God, says, I can do this. But there's a scene in one of the, it might be the first uh, Indiana Jones movies, you know where I'm going with this, and, and, and Indiana, he's coming down the street, and I don't know what he's doing, I don't know what he's doing, but this guy comes out, he draws his big sword, he does all this cool stuff with the sword. It's like, wow. And it's like, you know, as you first time you saw the movie, you guys know what I'm talking about? And it's like, what's going to happen? And then he kind of turns his, you know, reaching for, <laughs> and shoots the guy. It's like, whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. it's like, very impressive. <laughs> and it's, let's go. And it's like, and basically that's the story right here. Here's Goliath. He's shouting. He's got the armor. He's got the armor bearer. He's nine foot six. Fee, fi, fo, from, I'm going to eat the blood of an Israelite, whatever. And then, and he's got all this armor. It's like, man, if I got hit with that spear, if I got hit with that sword, if he got a hold of me with his hands, it'd be, ow, oh, that'd be terrible. But he's not going to get close enough. I'm just going to shoot him. And David, that's what David does. I mean, this story is not, again, please, it's a great Bible story. It's a great story of faith. But if you want to question the reality of the Bible and say, I don't know if it's true, you better stick with attacking Noah's flood, okay? Because this right here, is completely logical. This is a completely, I'm not, I'm not attacking Noah's flood story, I'm just saying, this story, it, it's like you've got a, a, a boy right here who's good at the sling stone, he's got confidence in God, he's killed the lion, he's killed the bear, and this guy's going to be, he's, a, he's nine foot six. It's like, I can see him. And you're going to pick up a stone and go, and shoot him in the forehead. It's like, what, what about the about the spear? I'm not, he's not, he's not going to get that close enough to throw a 15-pound a 15, a 15 spearhead. He's not going to get close enough to hit me with a spear. He's not going to get his hands on me. So, I mean, you understand right here? This is a logical story. This is not like some, this is not a miracle. 
You understand what I'm saying? Walking on the water is a miracle. Raising the dead is a miracle. Slinging a stone with a sling and shooting someone in the forehead who's standing over there mouthing off to God is it's, it's common sense. It's, it's the way you, the universe functions. Okay, you understand what I'm saying right there? So when you list all the miracles of the Bible, don't make this one of the miracles. So, so Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic, put on his coat of armor on him, and, and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened his sword over the tunic and tried walking around with because he was not used to them. I cannot go on these, he said, because I'm not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones. He didn't bring his sling along. He brought food along. So he has to find his own weapons or his own ammunition from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, approached the Philistine. Now, this is going to be fun too. David's going to get a few words in too. Verse 41, meanwhile, the Philistine, with his shield bearer in front of him, kept coming closer to David because he's got to get close enough to get his hands on him or throw something at him. He looked David over and saw that he was only a boy, ruddy, that means kind of rosy or tan probably, and, and handsome. Isn't that funny? Goliath notices that David's handsome. What a handsome young man. <laughs> That's what the text says here. He looked at David over and saw that he was only a boy, ruddy and handsome, and despised him. I, maybe it means that you, you look like a boy, you know, and that you have, you're not shaving yet. You know, you, you know. I think I'd be analyzing his armor instead of a good-looking kid. But anyway, uh, he said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods, which would include Dagon. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with the sword and spear and javelin. He looks off. David said, you're a good-looking man. He says, no. he says, no, I'm analyzing your armor. He says, I, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. You're in trouble because you're, I'm coming at you in the name of the God that you've been mocking and this is God's chance to sh show himself through somebody, and I'm going to step up and do it. This day the, the Lord will hand you over to me, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. Today I'll give the, the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth. In other words, he just nullifies the covenant. In other words, no, you're not going to, we're not going to become your servants, you're not going to become our servants. I'm going to kill you, and then we're going to kill everybody you're defending. We're just going to keep right. We're not going to make you servants. We're going to leave you out here in the, in the valley of Elah for food. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly towards him. Again, imagine, again, the Philistine's moving like this. You know, he's moving towards him to get his hands on him, throw something. And David's moving quickly. He's just, he's just running with his pistol, running up close enough to get a nice, clean shot at him. Uh, quickly, uh, David ran quickly towards the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, which is exactly what would happen if a stone hits a skull, and he fell face down on the ground. I mean, it's, not, it's like, Phoom. I mean, it's almost like anticlimactic. It's like, and here's the battle, the battle's being, yeah, he's dead. Boom. <laughs> We'll be right back after this. It's like, and you go to a commercial break. It's like it's over. There's nothing. That was it. As the Philistine, okay, okay, verse 50. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. David ran and stood over him. Now, again, this changes everything. On the battle line right here, after 40 days of everybody going back to their camp, playing cards, rolling dice, the Israelites going back, eating their supplies that their parents are sending him. It's like, uh oh. History has just been altered, at least this afternoon. It's like today is going to be different than the last 40 days because of David, because David took action. David did something. Everybody else really, as you know, probably was comfortable. We don't mind shouting, we're going to do this, yeah, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, okay, whatever, game over, we're going to go back and sit and play cards. David says, no, we're not going to put up with this anymore. We're going to do something is going to change today. He entered the battle, and things indefinitely changed, and caught everybody is caught off guard. Uh, he ran and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword and drew it from the scabbard, and he killed him 
at, excuse me, after he killed him, he cut off the head with the sword. So again, he, he kills him with the stone. Now he cuts off the Philistine's head. You, you got to wonder, where, where, are, where are all the other Philistines? I mean, I, this, this kid just kills Goliath. You would think someone's taking a, a shot at, you know, there's arrows should be coming in. You know, someone should be chasing down them. They're, they're stunned. They're, they're, they weren't even ready for battle. Maybe they're running back already. David cuts off the guy's head. And Israel's the same way. They're like, uh, Saul, Saul, did, uh, what do we do? Commanders are like, I, I, I'm not ready. I, everybody's caught off guard. David's saying, got him. <laughs> Holding up the head. Of course, you've got to imagine the blood that's running out of the head. No, and, I mean, you're right. You understand what I'm saying? There's a lot of blood in the head. He cuts off. Hey, hey, okay. And, and he's going to carry it. I mean, I'm sorry. This gets gross here. Um, he cut off the Philistine's head of the sword. When the Philistines saw that their hero, again, their Greek hero, their guy that was supposed to win the duel for him, was dead, they turned and ran. They weren't ready to fight. Then the men, I mean, just because, just because Goliath is dead, are the Philistines now powerless? I mean, really. They were powerful without Goliath. So all they've lost is the big mouth with the big, you know, the big body. They could certainly continue the war. But they're afraid. They're stunned. Uh, when the Philistines saw their hero was dead, they turned and ran. Then the men of Israel and Judah surged forward with a shout and pursued the Philistines to the entrance of Gath and to the gates of Ekron. So they, they chased them down the valley of Elah to Gath and to Ekron. You can see on the map where those, that's how far they chased them. Uh, uh, the dead were strewn along the uh, Sharim road to Gath and Ekron. Again, that's the Valley of Elah. There's a road there today. I mean, there's an inter not an interstate, but a road that follows it today. So it's just they follow the Valley of Elah where the road went. David took the Philistine's head and brought it to Jerusalem, and he put the Philistine's weapons in his own tent. So now David's going to get a tent. He's going to they're, they're with it. They're going to be kind of like a trophy thing. That he's going to be you know, they got the names on the wall of all the people he killed. Here's Goliath's sword, and his weapons are with David's tent in the future. As Saul watched David going out to meet the Philistine, he said to Abner, now here's the introduction to Abner, this is General Abner, we mentioned him before, he's Saul's cousin, he's the general of Saul's army, the Israel army. He asked, going out to war to meet the Philistine, he asked Abner, commander of the army, Abner, whose son is that young man? Who, who is that? Abner replied, as surely as you live, O king, I, I don't know. I have no idea where he came from. The king said, find out whose son this young man is so we can send them a condolence card because he's going to die in battle today. As soon as David returned from killing the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul. And here's a great line. With David still holding the Philistine's head. And he walks into the king's tent. It's like, was this the guy you were afraid of? Yeah, no problem. Whose son are you, young man? Saul asked. David says, I am the son of your servant Jesse of Bethlehem. Again, they've met before. David's played the harper before. But I think, again, Saul has not just got one or two people in his court or his palace. There's people coming and going, probably more than one armor bearer. And he's lost track of David. It says, after David had finished talking with Saul, now he's going to meet the prince. He's going to meet Prince Jonathan. Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. So after he got them talking to the king, he had, had, had a court with the king. They, they spoke. He turns from King Saul, and now he's going to get to address the prince. Prince Jonathan wants to talk to David. And it, you know what Jonathan has done? Jonathan is one who scaled up out of the, the valley, fought to attack the Philistines with him and his armor bearer, and David just pulled off something similar. Jonathan said, I haven't seen anything like that since, <laughs> since I did it. So it's like finally, he says, they became, it's obvious they're going to become kindred spirits because they both are going to fight the same way. They're both going to have the same faith and confidence. They both have an understanding of God the same and of the covenant of Israel. And, and they're going to take similar action. I mean, what a great team right here. David and Jonathan, I mean, these are two guys that, are, that you wish in history they could have somehow united. If they could have united their... their, their uh, their lines, their dynasties, which they were planning on doing. If they could have united their military ability, their faith. I just imagine what it would have been like, David and Jonathan fighting side by side, encouraging each other. After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. From that day, Saul kept David with him and did not let him return to his father's house. And Jonathan made a covenant. This is huge right here, verse 3. 
And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. David, this is going to come up. This is going to explain much of the rest of the story. David and Jonathan are going to swear a covenant to each other. Just like Israel's got a covenant with, with the Lord or different, you know, they make treaties with the Canaanites. These two guys are going to make a covenant, a treaty with each other, a treaty of friendship, a treaty of a, a military treaty. When he, uh, he loved him, uh, this right here, the word loved him, it, I wrote this in my notes, it has political overtones. It's used in diplomatic uh, uh, and co uh, commercial context. In other words, when it says loved right here, that's, that's the same idea of, of God loving Israel. Here it's got a, an overtone in other documents of a commercial overtone or of a, a political, diplomatic overtone. It's a covenant term. We have a covenant with each other. I will love you like myself. Oh, that means you have feelings for me? No, I'm making a treaty. When enemies attack you, I'll defend you, but I also expect you to defend me when enemies attack me because I'll let you use some of my crops and I'm going to have to use some of your transportation. It's a, it's a contract. It's it's like Hy-Vee having a contract with a trucking company. You know, it's like they loved the trucking company. What? That's strange. Right, because of the translation. Hy-Vee doesn't love the trucking company. They've got a contract. Do you have a contract? You have a cable contract. You have a phone contract. Do you love Verizon? It's like, no, I've got a contract with Verizon. I've got to send them. Right, it's a contract. That's what this is. Taught. This is nothing more. Uh, he made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. They were working together. Now again, there's, they're, they're two men, they're two humans, so they're going to have an emotional connection, a friendship connection. <laughs> Jonathan took off his robe he was wearing and gave it to David along with his tunic and even his sword, his bow, and his belt. What does that mean? Well, imagine, what do you think it means? The prince takes off his royal robe. He gives him one of the only few swords that are in Israel that are sharpened and ready. He gives, he gives David the royal possessions of the prince. What do you think that means? That means welcome to the clan, welcome to our club, welcome to the brotherhood. Just like a knight would join the knights templars because they joined the group, David now is one of the inner circle of the royal military elite. I mean, how, I mean, how simple can it be? Whatever, whenever Saul, whatever Saul sent him to do, David did it so successfully. The word successfully means also the word wise is in there. Wisely. So wisely that Saul gave him a high rank in the army. This pleased all the people and Saul's officers as well. So it, as far as public opinion, they're approving of David. The public ratings are going up. As far as the commanders, there's no bitterness or envy or jealousy. They're supporting. David's got public support. He's got the support of the commanders. And right here, he's acting wisely. Just like when he went to war, he didn't act in a powerful way. He didn't act in a reckless way. He analyzed the situation theologically. He analyzed it as far as a strategy. I'll run down there with a slingstone. I'll shoot the guy in the forehead. And all the charts and all the diagrams they had on the king's the war room, it's like, oh, we never thought of that. We never thought of the slingstone. Huh. Because we were so drawn into this intimidating man. We're trying to find maybe stacking two people on top of each other and fighting. Or maybe putting people in so heavy of an armor that they couldn't get crushed. It's like, did you think about just shooting him in the forehead with a, with a rock? It's like, oh, wow. And that's kind of what that means right here. He was successful because he, was, he wasn't thinking the way everybody else was thinking. He wasn't trying to match the enemy with the same strategy. It's like... I'm just going to shoot you in the forehead. While you've got your sword out and doing all your wild, cool stuff, I'll just shoot you with my pistol and go my way. So he found, he found success because of his wisdom. He pleased the people. He pleased the officers. When the men were returning home, at now everything is rocking and rolling. This is great. It's a great story. You can just see how right here, right here, Israel, could, everything's going to turn around. David is on the scene. He's, a, he's from Jesse, he, who's from Obed, who's from Boaz, who's connected back to uh, 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 Jericho, Rahab, and uh, Selman was the one who married her. We came across it. It's connected there. We've got the prince, Jonathan, who's proved himself a man of valor. You've got Samuel going, okay, things are coming together. <laughs> History is now going to turn a corner, and Israel's going to be established. 
Except we've got that problem, Saul. Saul is, well, here it is. Verse 6, when the men were returning home, again, home is to Gibeah. That's going back into the land of Benjamin. I keep wanting to think home is back to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is still occupied by the Jebusites. They're going back up to the tribe of Benjamin, up to Saul's house. Up to, and there, again, there was a palace there. When the men were returning home to Gibeah, going back to Saul's hometown, after David had killed the Philistine, the women, these are the women of the tribe of Benjamin. These are the women of Saul's community. These are the women of his tribe. The women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing. Saul's a winner, again. With joyful songs, with tambourines and lutes. Those would be triangles with the three strings on them. Some kind of like a little guitar. Three string guitar. As they danced, they sang. They're singing songs to Saul. And here's, here's the line. Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. This has got, in the, in, the, in, the, in the Hebrew, it's got three beat. Boom, boom, boom. There's three beat. Boom, boom. Saul has slain his thousands. Boom, boom, boom. David his tens of thousands. Boom, boom, boom. It's, 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 it's still got the Hebrew rhythm to it in the Hebrew. So when Saul hears this right here, it's like, what did they just sing? I thought this was about me being king. It's like, no, it's about you leading the people of Israel and doing whatever needs to be done to get Israel back on the map. No, no, no. What did they just say? Well, they said that you've killed your thousands and David has killed his tens of thousands. Saul was very angry. That means glowing, blazing up. It, it, it began to glow with anger. It began to blaze with anger. This refrain in the NIV, it says, galled him. The Hebrew word for gall is the word R-A-A -A, or ra'a. It means to spoil, to make no good or make good for nothing, to break down. It means he began to rot inside. His, his own soul, because of the anger, the jealousy, the envy that he had for David, he began to, he was gold. He began to rot away. Again, that doesn't mean physically rot away, but his soul now is, is even more corrupt. Saul was very angry. This refrain galled him. They have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but me with only thousands. What more can he get but the kingdom? And from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. It's like, what, what just happened? The, he just saw, it's like, I'm afraid he's going to take my kingdom. Does David look like he wants the kingdom? He was worried about the sheep. He's worried about God. He's not interested in your kingdom, Saul. But yet, now Saul is going to start treating David like what? Like an enemy. It's like, and now, when you get that inner fighting, it's like, Oh my gosh, it's like the greatest plan in history. You've got Samuel, you've got the king, you've got the royal prince Jonathan, who's one in spirit with David, another mighty man of valor. You've got the stage set, the mighty prophet, the king, two great men of valor. And David is going to be a leader of men. This is going to go play, this is going to go somewhere. Except the king is afraid someone's going to take his part of the pie. And he's going to end up take an attack, not the Philistines, and it's, it's going to become comical. There's going to come times where instead of fighting the Philistines, the Philistines are going to begin invading, but why can't Saul fight the Philistines? Because he's chasing David down through the hill country of Judea, trying to kill David. And the Philistines go, what's, what's Saul doing? He's fighting David? So they're going to come in and attack from the north and start running in over the country again. So it's very, very sad, very great warning right there of, of you know, not being intimidated by... Well, you know, someone that's helping you do your job. Well, anyway, hey, 1 Samuel 17. We're going to be in 1 Samuel 18, finishing this up, more of this. Now we begin a, a very interesting story. David is a mighty man, but God's going to put him through some tests and trials. It's going to be a 13-year period. This isn't going to happen just, you know, well, Saul's dead, now David's king. David's going to now become a fugitive. David's going to go from public rating number one. He's Public rating, he's very high. Saul is going to destroy his public reputation, and he's going to become public enemy number one. How bad? So bad that David's going to say, hey, guys, listen, it's going to be better for me if I go over and live with the Philistines. If I stay here, I'm going to get killed. And he's going to go over to the Philistines and say, hey, can I help you guys? They would love to have you. And the Philistines are going to welcome David, and Saul's going to say, fine, I got rid of David. It's like, this man ends up living peacefully with the Philistines because Saul hates him so bad. Does that even make sense? 
That's where this is going. Okay, I'm going to pray. I appreciate your time. Father, thank you again for the opportunity to look into your word. We thank you for the things we can see, the things we can learn. But Father, we especially thank you for the confidence that you can give us because of your, your truth, your faithless, the covenants you've got with us and the things that you're doing, the rightness and the righteousness that you've called us to, that you'll always defend, you'll always back up. And when you call us to do things, we know how to behave, we know how to act. Father, we ask that you lead and guide us, that we may be men of valor like, like Jonathan and, and David and, and face the enemy and not be intimidated by those that would discourage us from, from hearing your truth and walking in your truth. Again, we thank you for the examples we have here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you again.